Friends, we are honored to be joined by Sam Dingman, host of the popular podcast, Family Ghosts. Sam, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? I certainly can. Thank you for having me. Um, I am the host and um, I call myself the executive producer, but that um, title doesn't really feel right to me because I'm bad at execution. <laughs> um, I, let's say lead producer of Family Ghosts. Um, which is a podcast where in every episode, someone tells a story that has been in their family for generations. So the example I always cite is in the pilot episode, uh, I tell the story of this person that I grew up hearing about, my step-grandmother, who my grandfather was married to briefly in the 1960s, who turned out to be a jewel smuggler and was being pursued by the FBI and basically ruined my grandfather's life. That's the story I had always heard. I had always, it was one of those things that always came up at holiday meals after everybody had a few too many glasses of wine. And that's where the story always ended. And I always had this feeling like, come on, what's the rest of that story? I know there's more to that. And also had this feeling that if I could understand that, there were some things about myself and some things about my mom that would make a little bit more sense to me. Um, and so that kind of challenge and quest to learn the truth is what happens in every episode of our show. And another thing that I'm very proud of on the show is that <clears throat> in every episode, we change the genre a little bit. So sometimes you're going to hear a story like that told as a traditional audio documentary of the kind you might recognize on a radio show like This American Life. Sometimes it's going to be more of a long form monologue with original music, um, sometime, like something you might see in a theater. Um, and then we've also done some weird stuff, like we have an all-musical episode. Um, so it's also a really cool opportunity to get to play with audio formats in a way that's very exciting to me. Um, prior to getting to do this show, um, oh, and I should say also we're at, we've just launched our third season of the show. So I feel like we're just kind of figuring out what the hell we're doing. Um, and then prior to that, I was a producer for a number of years at a podcast network called Panoply, which is sadly no more. Um, I have a hunch we will talk more about that later in the conversation. Um, and then before that, I worked at WNYC, which was the public radio station in, which is the public radio station in New York. And then before that, I worked kind of accidentally in the tech sector for seven years um, and would come home every night after doing that and try to teach myself how to make really excellent podcasts, including some with our esteemed host here, Mr. Garrett Hall, with whom I began my audio journey literally 20 years ago at the college radio station, uh, WSRN in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, where we, um, I think it's the statute of limitations has expired and we can talk about this. We got a radio show by walking confidently into the radio station and informing the person who was there to start what they thought was their radio show that they'd been fired <laughs> and that we were now doing that time slot instead. And for reasons that are still unknown to me, they were like, okay, and they just left. <laughs> um, and then they made us directors of the, talks, of the talk department at WSRN. I, I don't know how that happened either. You can't make a novel without breaking a few eggs, right? <laughs> oh, we, uh, we broke some eggs. <laughs> Now, obviously, um, you know, you kind of went backwards chronologically through this story, um, mm -hmm. which is a very interesting story. And obviously, as, you know, just from the hearing that, it's not exactly a straight line. But no. was there sort of a sense of what you were doing wasn't working throughout this? And then at some point, something clicked? And what would that moment sort of start to be? Hmm. Well, when I, um, I, have, I have always loved radio. Um, and for me, that starts with, I have, my, my earliest fond memories of it are listening to uh, baseball games on the radio with my dad. And there was something about that, just this quality of it, it, listening to baseball on the radio, it feels like time stops, you're in the room with somebody else, you're looking at them, you're talking to them, you're interacting with them, but you're also collectively paying attention to this other thing that's this story that's happening somewhere in real time it's unfolding and you're you're hanging on every word of it but it it's not pulling you out of your day-to-day -day life in the way that watching something on tv does um so i think that was the first time that i really felt a bond with it and then the other things i have always been interested in my life are theater and 
music and writing. And the thing that I love about radio, particularly the form of it that I get to do now, is that it really is a combination of all those things. It's a writing project, it's a performance project, it's, an, um, it's a musical project in the sense of trying to use music as a narrative tool, but also um, conceive of and, and select the right music to augment certain moments and things like that. So I have always had that sense within myself about this as a medium. But when I moved to New York, um, which was only shortly before you did, um, I moved here, I, I went to, I studied theater in school and that was my, my real thought about what my life was gonna be, was I was, I was gonna be an actor. Um, and I think the, sh the thing that I realized at a certain point is that when you wanna work in the creative world in some way, and I'm sure this is true for, for other fields as well. I just don't know those fields quite as well. Um, particularly with creative stuff, because there is no path, there, there's no clear, clearly defined path for how you find professional success doing it. Um, the odds are against you ever making any money for it. Um, and the standards, as they should be, are very high for your work to stand out from the vast flock of people who also want to do this kind of thing. And the one truism I felt like I kept hearing in interviews with artists that I admired was that at a certain point, whatever their medium was, whether it was writing or painting or acting or dancing or um, radio, is that at a certain point, they just decided, this is the only thing that I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna do this thing. It's what I'm gonna give all of my time to. And something that I was finding as I got to New York and appeared in um, fairly, a fairly subpar string of theatrical productions, <laughs> um, which uh, we do not have to go into, suffice it to say they were tremendously embarrassing. Um, and thank you, Garrett Hall, for coming to see a lot of them <laughs> against your better judgment. Um, Something that I was finding is that when I was, when I would get off whatever day job I had, um, the thing that I was spending all my time doing was not going to auditions, was not looking for auditions, was not, um, I don't know, deciding that I should apply to theater school. It was trying to make audio. Trying to trying to make radio, trying to to tell stories in that way, um, and so I think over time there was a realization like if this is what I'm feeling organically pulled towards, then maybe I should just follow that instead of resisting it because it's not what I told myself the journey was going to be. And then at the same time, um, I was doing sketch comedy with our mutual friend, Mr. Ben Mastin, and. We spent a lot of time writing these comedy sketches that were, um, you know, like, what if there were two cosmic archers who landed on a bizarre planet and tried to blow it up for some reason? Um, or what if there was a magic ukulele? Like, the kinds of things that you write when you're first starting to write sketch comedy. Um, and those sketches didn't go over great. But something that really started to work is we started to write these sketches that were just based on our actual lived experience. And I remember the first one we wrote was this idea like Ben said at some point in conversation, sometimes I wish I could go back in time and punch my 15 year old self in the face. And so we wrote this sketch where he does that. I play him at 15, which is already a little bit funny because we look nothing alike. Um, and you know, I say all the things that he really said to him said out loud when he was 15 that are of course horribly embarrassing and you get to see him react to the fact that he said those things and we had this whole conversation and the writing of that sketch was just so alive and it brought all these things up that um neither of us had thought about in a long time about adolescence and then when we performed it it, it got this response that just felt so deeply connective with the audience um and so for me that that really started me on a path of wanting to, to write and tell stories more in that vein. And when I combined that creative impulse with the fact that 
I was already wanting to spend all my time working on audio and telling stories in a radio and podcast medium augments the intimacy of telling these already very intimate sorts of stories. For me, that was, that was when it really clicked. And that was when I felt like I really started to make things in sound that I felt really proud of and wanted to share. Um, and then in terms of a literal moment when it clicked, um, I remember uh, through a, a series of misadventures, I, um, well, how much detail is it okay to go into? As much as you like. If it's uh, anything terrible, I can always edit it out. Okay, right. Um, I'm so used to editing out other people's terrible digressions. So as I'm about to launch into one, I'm like, would I edit this out? But anyway. Um, so I knew that I, I'd been doing that. I was in that headspace for a long time of coming home at night from work and just um, making my own stuff. And at a certain point, I had this realization, like, this is what I want my job to be. I want this to be my life. I want this to be what I do. And so I wrote to the producers of a WNYC show called On the Media, that is one of my favorite radio shows. And I said, look, I, I know how to edit audio. I've been doing it for a while. I would really like to work in the field. Um, can I come in for a week? I'll take a week off my job and I'll just come in and you guys put me to work. I just want to learn what it's like to work on a radio show for a week. And they said, what? <laughs> Um, and I said, just trust me, if, if you would have me, I, here's some stuff that I've made, I'd love to come do that. And so they said yes. And so I went in and that week that they basically, they had two projects that they needed somebody else to do. They were a little short staffed. And one of them was editing together this interview that one of the hosts had done with a journalist. And one of them was writing um, they were doing a segment about personality quizzes on the internet. So they asked me to write a fake one that was kind of on theme for the show. And they really liked both of those projects that I did. And so at the end of the week, they said, this was great. Do, do you want to like work here? Would you want to like work at this radio show? And I was like, yes, that's the whole point. That's why I did this. <laughs> and they said, well, your timing is really good. Um, we're going to be looking for new producers soon. St stay in touch. And I remember walking out and thinking, oh my God, this, it's going to happen. Like this, this thing that I wanted to happen, it, it's totally going to happen. And then one entire year went by <laughs> of them not responding to any of my emails. Um, I would write them all the time and say, ah, I put together this interesting little podcast episode um, today. I thought, I thought I would share it with you. Still super interested in continuing that conversation that you said you wanted to have with me. Crickets, 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 crickets. And I had this realization at a certain point, this is never going to happen unless I put myself in a position where it has to happen. Because if I continue to just try to operate within the safety of the bubble of this, I was working at Google at the time, which um, was financially speaking, a very comfortable place to be. But it also meant that I didn't ever have to challenge myself to make audio my only viable path. And I had been able to save up a little bit of money. I had enough money to live for like six months. Um, and so I remember I decided, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna quit Google. I don't know if anything's ever gonna happen with on the media, but um, if this is what I want my life to be, I need to make it so that this is my life. And right around the time that I made that decision, one of the producers who had worked it on the media that week that I was there, sent an email to this um, radio jobs listserv that I was on saying that she had just started working at this new podcast network and that they were looking for freelance producers. And so I wrote to her and I said, I don't know if you remember me from the time, this time at On The Media, we only met for a couple of days, but um, I would love to apply to do some freelance work for you. And so she wrote back and she had me do a little edit test and she said, this is great, yes. So they gave me a weekly gig of editing one episode for a very small amount of money, it was $250. Um, so, you know, quitting a job for a job that pays $250 a week is not um, smart, but that's what I did. And I thought, well, at least I know this one thing is going to be coming in and hopefully I can build off of that. And so I remember I, I left Google my last day, then it was the weekend, then it was a Monday. Our mutual friend, Alan, came over. At the time, Alan and I were uh, doing this independent baseball podcast that we 
didn't plan very well. And um, so we were just riffing at the beginning of the show and Alan said, oh, Sam, why don't you, um, why don't you tell, the, tell the listeners about the big decision you just made? And I said, oh yes, uh, I've just quit my job. I wanna focus on podcasting full time. Don't know where it's gonna go, very excited. So that was a Monday. I edited that episode together, I put it up. Tuesday morning, I got an email is that horn terrible for you? Okay. Um, there's mayhem in the streets of New York City, people. Mayhem outside. Um, so that Tuesday morning, I get an email from the producer of On The Media, the woman I have been emailing for a year begging for work, saying, hey, I, I listened to that episode of your baseball podcast um, that said you're, you quit your job and you want to work in radio now. Why don't you come work with us? And to this day, I have no idea why after a year of me emailing her, she decided that particular week to listen to my podcast about baseball, which as far as I know, she does not care about at all. But I of course wrote back and said, yes, when can I start? So, you know, in one sense you could say it's this incredibly fortunate thing that um, I, within a week of quitting my job, had a freelance gig at this podcast network and um, a producing job at this fairly prestigious radio show that I had loved for a long time. And some of that is good fortune, of course, but none of it would have happened without the, at that point, you know, 15 years of work that had gone into it of over time realizing if this is what I wanna do, I have to give all of my available time to it to, develop my own set of instincts and tastes and impulses so that when the universe for some reason decides to say, here's this opportunity, I was in a position to walk in there on the first day and whatever they asked me to do, I was able to say, yes, I can do that at a degree of quality that I think you would feel good about. Um, so that's the real story. Of wow, I'm there's a lot of amazing lessons in there that I think you know, make sense for podcasting, but really any industry that people might want to go into, whether creative, technology, uh, yeah, you know, like focusing on what you want to do, persistence, obviously. Um, I'm a little curious to drill down on this baseball podcast, which you glossed over a little bit. But yeah. on some level, I would say that, you know, being your friend for some time, I saw that you were trying these endeavors. And generally, they would not kind of go outside of um, the circle of our friend group. You know, they were, you know, well regarded, um, but there was not really a built in audience. And then when you started doing this baseball podcast, it was very specifically focused on Baltimore Orioles with a kind of combination of leftist Brooklyn politics. Um, <laughs> but yeah. that really, compared to the other previous projects, seemed to hit it big for you, it seemed like to me. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that. But um, you know, would you talk a bit more about that in particular? And you know, if that was uh, what, you know, more successful, why you think that was? Sure. I think, I mean, you're correct that that show found what at the time for me was an audience that was approximately 100 times larger than any other piece of audio that I had ever put out into the world previously. And what I mean when I say that, just to be completely transparent, because I feel like people aren't usually transparent enough in these conversations. Um, when I was making the, the other show that was more of a, a narrative storytelling variety adventure um, sort of show, um, I would put out the episodes and they would get between three and five downloads. That's, <laughs> there's no zeros after those numbers. Um, and I remember the first episode of the baseball show that we put out, it got 312 downloads. And that was without any promotion, that was without any attempt to make the world aware of it. So why did that happen? Um, I think the, the reason is that there was a combination of factors. One is that at that point I had been, that was, I think we made the first one of those in 2012. So I think at that point I had been making audio for 12 years and um, had intensively been making audio for the previous three. So I think there was some amount of um, finding an idea that had a larger potential audience at the same time as my skill level was up to the task. 
And then I think the other part of it was, um, you know, I'm a big believer um, against the judgment of most professional collaborators that I talk to, that thinking about a creative project from an audience first standpoint, I think is a terrible idea. Um, because I think it leads inevitably to um, trying to guess about the tastes and desires of a vast invisible group of people of indeterminate size and composition. Um, and for me, that can really drive you nuts. And I also think it implies that the only reason that you're making the thing is to earn money off of it. And um, I am a doe-eyed sap and would prefer to think that um, the impulse to create these things comes from the fact that you wanna put, you wanna put something of yourself in, in the world that is somehow connective. To go back to that idea of the sketch when Ben was 15, there was something about that that felt really, we were forming some kind of bond. However, <laughs> I do remember thinking there's a specificity to the fact that we're talking just about the Orioles and leftist Brooklyn politics. Um, it is known to me that there are tons of people who love the Orioles, that the Orioles are very hard to love because they're very bad at their chosen endeavor, which is playing the game of baseball. Um, and baseball, for me, has this really, as I mentioned with listening to the games on the radio, baseball has this deep emotional well associated with it, and I'm sure that's true for other people. For me, my love of it comes from listening to it on the radio, and podcasting is not so far off from radio. And there aren't any other Orioles podcasts. No one else is doing this. But there's plenty of people who listen to podcasts. Um, and this was in 2012. So podcasting had been, I've been listening to podcasts since 2006. But, you know, the, the great boom in podcasting didn't happen until 2014. So it was still, the podcast listener was still a very certain type of person. So it was a little bit of a gamble that this kind of, um, audio aware, emotionally open, thoughtful, story inclined, baseball enthusiast might appreciate this particular kind of show because I wish this show existed for me to listen to. So that, that was kind of the combination of decisions that went into it. And we were, that impulse was, like I said, rewarded in terms of listenership right away. Um, and I have to say it was a very good feeling to put, you know, I put a tremendous amount of work into the other, um, much less specific from a subject matter standpoint show that I was making simultaneously with the baseball show. And it was a very good feeling to put all the work that goes into making a podcast out into the world. And instead of putting it out there and feeling like, you know, it just exists somewhere on a server, um, and maybe somebody will hear it one day. There was a real excitement and a real dynamism to the feeling that we were starting to build this community of listeners who, you know, if if we were a little bit late posting an episode, we would get emails from them, and um, we would, you know, it's this. It was a common tale for me on the other show to say, "Listeners, write in and tell me your thoughts on this," and nobody would do that. Um, and on this show, we would say that, and we would have too many emails to get to. Um, and that's at a very low scale, like I said, like just a few hundred listeners. Um, so that was a very, it was a very powerful experience. I'm curious to hear a bit more about this timing that you mentioned, because it seems like you on some level timed this perfectly with podcasts uh, becoming a thing around 2014, I think you said. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do you think that there's a sense of being too early or too late to the game? And if you happen to be either too early or too late, it's not possible. But if you just happen to get the timing right, then you can you know, get some success or... Well, I think in podcasting specifically, my timing was really good. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, because I think particularly this year, 
you know, your viewers may be aware as, as people who follow um, various things that happen in the startup and entrepreneur world. Um, last year, Gimlet Media, which is probably the best known podcast network, was acquired by Spotify for something like $250 million. And that is very much seen as a, um, a game-changing moment in audio. Um, because what happened is that this thing that used to be a medium characterized by folks like myself from 2009 to 2012, who had these weird little ideas and this very specific set of skills um, that they were kind of honing and crafting um, and finding very niche but loving and focused sets of audiences along the way. What happened starting in 2014 um, and continuing on to this moment is that it became an environment of, I guess, intellectual property is the way it get, that gets talked about now. It became an intellectual property environment that there's a lot of interest in having shows by celebrities and there's a lot of awareness that these shows can find very large audiences. And so that has led to this attempt to basically turn the entire industry into, I mean, I guess the most cynical way of describing it would be a content farm for more prestigious forms of intellectual property, books, television shows, and movies. Um, and I'm very happy for people who do the work that I do to, um, be rewarded, um, in vast, with vast sums of money for the work that they have done. But I think there's a real, I feel like there's a real, there should be a real note of caution on the wind as this is happening because the medium became such a rich vein for that kind of investment because the people who started doing the work that fostered the, the development of those very large audiences were treating the making of audio as their primary concern. They weren't doing it because they wanted it to be licensed and turned into something else. Um, the, the way it gets talked about in a lot of podcast business conversations is they treated audio as a first class citizen. Um, and I think as long, so my feeling about podcasting specifically is that as somebody who came to it with that as a goal, I don't ever want to lose sight of that, whatever. I've been fortunate enough to have some exciting things happen with Family Ghosts. Um, it hasn't been adapted into a TV show or anything, but um, I have been fortunate enough to get some attention and, and love for the work that we do. Um, and I'm very grateful for that and really excited about it, but I feel like it is my charge to maintain my hold on the impulse that led me to sit down and do this kind of stuff in the first place. Um, because that's the only way that any of the rest of it happened to go back to what we were talking about earlier. Um, and I would like to think that that impulse is the way to guide oneself through whatever professional environment one is in that, um, that like the one thing that can't be manufactured is a creative spark, an organic passion for the project that you're working on or the thing you're trying to make. Um, nobody can plant that in you. It's, it's just, it's the, it, it's, it lives inside you already and it's there for you to follow. And you don't always know where it will lead you, but it will probably lead you to a place where you not only feel fulfilled by the work that you're doing and at such time as the professional or corporate environment decides to smile on that particular thing, you will be very well positioned to reap the benefits of that random cosmic chance. <laughs> so is there still opportunity for someone just getting into podcasting today, or would you suggest that they try and find whatever the next podcasting industry is and jump on that, you know, virtual reality casting or who knows what? Well, I, I mean, Probably the smartest advice in media right now is to get really good at TikTok. 
um, which I've still never used. Um, although it just came out that it has all these security vulnerabilities, so proceed with caution, I suppose. Um, I'm mean, also shocker, it has all these security vulnerabilities. Um, I guess my, my advice with podcasting specifically would be if you have a creative idea in your head, whether that creative idea is a talk show about your favorite kinds of fountain pens or a documentary series about, you know, some kids that got kidnapped or something like whatever, whatever range of um, subject matter, this idea uh, falls into. Um, if the best way that you can think of to tell that story is in sound, um, then you should definitely start a podcast because it's incredibly fun. It's unbelievably fulfilling. It's very hard to get the sound in a place where it will sound like your favorite things to listen to, but it's also easier than it's ever been. Um, there's a website called transom.org that has these little startup kits that you can buy. It tells you everything that you need to buy. They have price points ranging from like $150 all the way up to you know $10,000. Um, audio is one of those things that you can spend as much money as you want on, and I have. Um, but I would say to only do that if it genuinely feels to you like audio is the best medium for it. And then the second thing I would say is put yourself into the work because what people respond to in audio, I think across the board, regardless of genre, is a sense that they are on a journey with, with a creative person or creative people. Um, that they are literally sitting in, that, that they have these, these people who are driven and animated by this really exciting thing are riding side saddle in their heads, like sitting in their headphones, just a company. At, and they, you get to like ride along with them as they go on this journey. That is the intoxic, that, that's the whole magic of the medium. That's the thing that intoxicates people. Um, and you can't fake that. You can't, it's, it's not a fakeable thing. Um, and that said, that, that thing for this moment, that it could change this year. Right now there, there is not gatekeeping to, um, you know, if you think about it in a professional sense, you can't make a TV show and put it on Netflix. You can't um, write a book and, I mean, I guess you can self-publish a book, but from, a, a, you know, you can't like write a book that is then sold in a bookstore. Um, but the equivalent of, the, of that level of prestige for a, a made piece of art, that level of prestige and distribution is available to you as a podcaster. The only places people can get podcasts right now are Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, um, and then there's a whole constellation of apps that access those directories. But there is no barrier to you making something that shows up in one of those directories right next to This American Life. There's no barrier to it. That day may be coming to an end sometime soon. I don't have any specific information about that, but the wind is blowing in that direction. So if the answer to all those first questions that I asked about audio for you are correct, get in now. One thing that definitely comes across through hearing this is how throughout this 20 year journey you've been on, you learned from kind of each thing you're trying on, be it you know, hard skills or soft skills and iterated based on that. Um, so I'm curious, you know, having gone through now three successful seasons of Family Ghosts, what have you learned? What's the most important lessons you've learned from this that you'd apply to either future mm. seasons of Family Ghosts or whatever your next project may be? Well, um, tell me if these answers are too specific to audio documentary making, but the biggest, 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 biggest one is um, by, by setting out to make an audio documentary, you are taking on an incredibly difficult writing project. And if you don't like writing and you don't like revising 
and you don't like listening to the same story over and over and over again in a wide variety of um, different structures, if you don't like having somebody recommend that you pull your entire thing apart that you spent six straight sleepless nights on and starting over from the beginning, if that's not exciting to you, don't do it. Um, and, and, and also if you, if, you, if you yourself do not enjoy writing or you don't have people in your creative network who want to partner with you as, as writers, um, you're gonna have a hard time. You're gonna have a really, really hard time. And a lot of people think podcast and they think it's just sitting down and talking. And there are some shows where that is the case. Um, but for audio documentary making, if you're not ready to write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite, don't do it. Um, so that's the biggest one. I, I happen to love writing, but um, the, the sheer volume of writing and rewriting that you have to do, and if you are trying, as we try to do on the show, to um, you know, tell 12 to 15 different stories in a season, you have to find other people to collaborate with and you have to make sure that those people are also up for that amount of writing and rewriting and revising. So that's one thing. Um, at an even higher professional level, I cannot say this with any higher degree of um, urging, and I imagine, Garrett, that you uh, would agree with this. Um, maintain the ownership of what you make at all costs. Um, I don't know if this is, the, for podcasting specifically, the landscape around this is changing largely based on my, an experience that I went through along with many other people, which is Panoply, the network that I used to work at, went out of business. Because I was a full-time employee of Panoply's when I created Family Ghosts, even though I was the creator of it, the whole idea came from me and I did all the work. Panoply, from a legal standpoint, owned the show. And so I went through this agonizing six month period where I had to buy my own work back from a company that no longer existed. Um, and that is a hellish dystopia that I do not wish on anyone. Um, and what I should have done, and it's very difficult to think this way when you're in a position where somebody wants to pay you money for the thing that you are most passionate about in the world. But what I should have done at the point that they said, we would like to produce and make your show is I should have said to them, we need to talk about ownership before that happens. Um, I want there to be a contingency plan in place for what happens with the show if I am no longer an employee of this organization. And there can be gradations to that. There can be, you know, you could, there's a lot of ways that an agreement like that can take place, but don't, it, if money is starting to get involved in your creative process, your ownership of the material is the most precious, precious thing that you have. Um, you don't have control, you know, you don't have control over who's going to want to buy ads on it. You don't have control over who's going to want to adapt it into a movie or something like that. Um, but you do have control over deciding what the life of this, this work that you do is. And you just, you do not want to give that to anybody else. Um, because it, it's heartbreaking when it happens. Uh, very funny. Ownership is worth absolutely nothing until it's worth everything, right? <laughs> yep. Yep. But I think, you know, to be honest, I think that is a point, that's a really important point that you just made. And I think it underscores the idea of only starting a project like this if it is actually something that animates you so much that it wakes you up in the middle of the night. Um, because if it is not that thing, there's a lower likelihood that it's going to reach a point where the ownership of it might be worth something. And when it does reach that point where the ownership of it might be worth something, you want to be passionate enough about it to have the very unpleasant fights that you have to have about it in order to maintain that ownership. Excellent. I mean, this has all been really fascinating and I really do appreciate you taking the time to share all these stories. And you know, before I um, you know, let you get back to you know, many more hours of audio editing, is there anything else that you'd like to tell anyone who's interested in how to succeed at podcasting? Um, well, first off, thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. It's literally my 
as you can tell from my extremely long-winded and rambling answers, it's my favorite thing to talk about. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk to everybody about it. I hope that if anything I have described is um, interesting to you, that you'll check out the show. It's called Family Ghosts. It's available wherever fine podcasts are available. Um, I think that the main thing that I, w <laughs> I would like to say is there, there's this, there's this, there's two quotes that I think about, or th three things I think about a lot when it comes down to what can be a really paralyzing question, which is you want to create something and you want to put it into the world um, and you're trying to figure out whether you're approaching it right or whether people are going to like it. Um, and I think because that question is so complex and overwhelming, it's really important to try to distill it down to a couple of fundamental guidelines. Um, and so I want to share those with you. The first one is, and this is totally apocryphal, but from what I have, what I understand, this is the story of how the Spanish dish paella came to exist. Um, there was this princess in this old um, Spanish kingdom and uh, she was beloved by all of the, the, the peasants because um, she was thought to have a tremendous amount of empathy for their, for their lives. And word comes to this one town that she's going to be passing through one night and will be stopping in to pay a visit to everybody in the town. And this one particular farmer is in a total panic about it because he doesn't know what he's gonna serve her because um, all he has are these very simple foods. Um, and so he starts rummaging through his house and trying to figure out what he can possibly make that will be worthy of her visit. Um, and so he, he finds some rice and he finds some old fish and he finds some, some sausage um, and he, he puts it in a pan and he starts just like furiously whipping this thing together and he, and he makes this concoction um, and he serves it to one of his kids. And one of his kids says like, this is amazing. Like, why is this so good? It's just rice and fish and meat. Um, and the farmer says, no, it's, it's for her. And the name paella is, uh, I believe it's an elision of the words para and aya, which means for her. So he says, no, it, it's for her. It's not just this mix of things, it's, it's for her. And the lesson there, of course, is that he had, he had a vision and an intention behind what he was doing. And it didn't matter what the raw materials were. So I think that's a, a really important parable for making things. Another one is a quote from Al Pacino, um, which is somebody asked him once, like, how do, you, uh, how do you make your choices when you're putting a character together? And he said, I go with the glow, I go with the glow. Um, which I think is, is basically just another version of, of the paella thing. Like he's just doing what, what seems most right inside of him and he trusts himself to honor those choices. Um, that story only works if you think Al Pacino is a really good actor, but I do. Um, and then the, the last one is, um, it's a line from the TV show Mad Men, um, which I think is the whole ball game. I, th I think everything is contained in this exchange of dialogue. Um, if you know the show, you know that Don Draper is this visionary writer of um, ad copy, um, but that um, what's I think really brilliant about the show is that when he writes ad copy, he's really writing about the, um, the paradox of human existence um, as reflected through advertising. Um, and he's legendary for his ability to come up with these campaigns that just captivate people and totally take their breath away. And he has uh, this woman who works in the office who is also really, really talented, um, and she really admires him, and she wants to be more like him, Peggy. And uh, Peggy is up late uh, in the office one night, and, and she's working on this campaign, and she can't get it, and she can't get it, and she can't get it. And so she says to Don Draper, how do you do it? Like, how do you give people what they want? And he says, you can't give people what they want. It has to be what you want. And I think that's the key to the whole thing. Very wise words to end on. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me.